Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, let's turn to John chapter 11. As we continue in our study of the book of John. Amen. Amen. John chapter 11, we'll be reading from verse 19 to 44 today. John 11, 19 to 44. Amen. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid in? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how we loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he had been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Amen. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Lose him and let him go. And the Lord blessed the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. Our focus today is on the raising of Lazarus. The title of our message is Jesus Raises Lazarus. Jesus Raises Lazarus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege once again to gather at your feet. There is no better place to be. Because, Lord, you are the source of eternal life, of the words of eternal life. And so we've gathered as your children for nourishment, for refreshment, for revival, for growth, for nurturing, O oh God, through your word. So, Father, our prayer is that our expectations will be met today in the mighty name of Amen. Jesus. Lord, we have just come to be fed by your word. 
Lord, we pray, Lord, that your word will find a good heart, a, a good soul, even in our hearts, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, Lord, the requisite faith, oh Lord, to mix with your word. Father, Lord, we pray you will grant unto us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, I submit myself to your holy hands. I pray, Lord, that you will use me this morning, oh Lord, as only you can in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. That, Father, Lord, that after it all, at the end of it all, the glory will only be yours in the mighty name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus name we have prayed amen. Amen. amen so last week um, we started this chapter chapter 11 and uh, in that message we examined um, the sickness and death of Lazarus who we are reading was looking today at his resurrection as he's been raised from the dead last week we looked at the sickness and the death and we looked at it specifically from the perspective of Christ we looked at it from the view, from the vantage points of how Jesus was looking at the whole events as it unfolded. The sickness, the message that was sent out to him from the sisters who were obviously worried, the death, and then the mourning. And so we saw there, we, we focused on four encouraging truths for us in the times of trouble. Because you see, Mary and Martha have something in common with us. They were loved by Christ, Amen. just as we are loved by Christ. Amen. And they went through this difficult time in their life. And from there, we could see four encouraging truths that I believe, I hope, I pray will be of uh, benefit to us. One is that Jesus loves us even in the midst of our troubles. Amen. His love never gets truncated or suspended at any point in time. The Bible says His love is an everlasting love. Second, we saw that Jesus knows our troubles. His eyes is constantly upon us, looking, knowing everything that we are going through, even in our innermost hearts, even the things that we cannot express in words. And we see all, the third point was that we see that Jesus has a plan for our troubles. We see Jesus saying that he was going to go to Bethany to raise Lazarus up from the dead. He knew what it needed to be done. He was not caught unawares. By the same token, even when we go through difficulties, we should be encouraged that God has a plan for us. He is not caught off guard by what the things that we go through. And the final point that we looked at last week was that this world is not the end of it all. This world is not the end of this of it all. In the grand scheme of things, this world is shorter than the blink of an eye compared to the eternity that is to come. And this perspective, Jesus said, you know, gave it up and said that, you know, Lazarus was sleeping because the time will come when he will be raised up. Not just because he was going to raise him up, but there is a time that is coming when all the dead in Christ will be raised up to start a life of eternity with our Lord. And it's important for us to keep these pers this perspectives in mind to encourage us even when we go through difficulties. Today we continue on in this chapter and we'll be focusing on the circumstances that lead up to Jesus raising Lazarus. So as we, what we've done is we've picked up the story from verse 19. We picked up the story from verse 19 where Jesus, you know, started out from his journey and is now basically at the entrance of the town of Bethany. The town of Bethany, which is where Lazarus uh, and his sisters Martha and Mary lived. And so Jesus is at the entrance and this is exactly four days after Lazarus had died and had been buried. Lazarus had died and been buried four days before and we see here that what is happening is that over that period of time, Mary and Martha have had people rally around them. We see a community rallying around them in verse, in, in, in verse 19. We see, we see that many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So the four days of mourning, four days of comforting has already occurred by the time Jesus arrives in Bethany. But what we learn is that Martha, learning of Jesus' arrival, rushed out of the house to meet him. And then we see from verse 20 to verse 27, we see a lengthy exchange, a conversation taking place. It's a substantial conversation, one that we'll go to in a little bit more details later on. But we see that Martha goes out to meet Jesus and starts talking to him. And then after Jesus spoke, after Martha speaks with Jesus for a while, 
she now goes back home and tells her sister Mary that Jesus is on his way. And so Mary also gets up from the house and goes out and, he meets, and she meets with Jesus. And she also interacts with him. But we notice that the interaction that she has with Jesus is quite different from the one that Martha has. Even though they are sisters, even though they both love, lost a brother they loved very much, their interaction is different. We see that Mary's interaction is quite is few words. It is more of emotions. It was the emotions that were doing all the talking. Mary was weeping. Jesus wept. So we see that. And then finally we see after this happens, Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And once again we see Jesus here now says a few words to the Father. He says a few words to the Father. And after that, he says three words to the dead. He says three words to the dead. Lazarus comforts. And those three words were enough. For the one who was dead, who was bound up, who was buried uh, in the tomb to rise up from, his, from death and to walk out of the grave. And so this is sort of a summary of all that we've read. And as we go deeper into this, I want us to just focus on three points. We'll also be viewing all of these circumstances from the perspective of Christ. What is it that we can learn about Jesus even in this uh, account of the re resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, the resurrection, of course, is the big news. It's the headline news. Lazarus was raised from the dead after four days. That is the headline news. But what else can we learn concerning Jesus? And as we look into the scriptures, we'll see that there's so much that is useful that we can learn about our Lord, even from this account. But we'll focus today on just three points. One is we'll see the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus is something that comes up over and over in these few verses that we've read. Also, we see the compassion of Jesus. We see the compassion of Jesus or his humanity, if we might put it that way, that is coming up here. And finally, we see as a third point, we see the, the, the glory of Jesus. I might put it that way. The glory of Jesus coming forth uh, uh, even in these few verses. So let's start with our first point, the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus for any Bible scholar and even anyone who sort of pays attention has been and remains the most controversial aspect of his ministry here on earth. For the, all the four Gospels that account that describe Jesus' uh, 33, uh, three and a half years of ministry, his identity, who he is, was definitely the most controversial one. In Matthew 16, 13 to 37, Matthew 16, 13 to 37, we see Jesus, you know, cognizant of this, ask his disciples, he says, who do men say the Son of Man is? Like, who am I? People can relate to the miracles he has done. They can relate to the healings. They can relate to the feeding. They can relate, you know, to the teachings. They can relate to the prophecies that come out of him as a man of God. But who do they say he is? In John 10, as we, if we, if we recall a few weeks ago, we saw there that Jesus actually fled. That's just the incident that occurred before um, the death of Lazarus. We see that Jesus fled from Judea, from Jerusalem, because he had gotten into one of his many conflicts with the religious leaders on the issue of his identity. And in this instance, we had seen him proclaim himself to be divine as the Son of God, that he and the Father were one. And for that reason, they wanted to stone him. And so, his, his, and so there he fled. And so it was still the issue of his identity. Who is Jesus? Who is he? If we ask a lot of people, I mean, it is many things, even today, to many people. Some people describe him as a great moral teacher. Some describe him as a great a preacher. Some people describe him as a great prophet. Some describe him as a very generous man who did many good things to many people. But really, who is Jesus? And his identity matters. Why does his identity matter? Because identity matters to us. As human beings, our identity defines and determines how people relate to us. And so unless we have a clear understanding of, G of who Jesus is, we will not be able to relate to him in the right way. In fact, what ultimately separates Christians from non-Christians is simply this question of identity. Who is Jesus? For the Christian, he is the Lord. Amen. The Son of God who was sent down to redeem all of mankind back to God. 
That is just a simple difference. And anyone who confesses and believes that is a Christian. So what can we learn from these interactions that we've seen in these passages? So let's just go to verse 20 and verse 27 to see what Martha has to say about Jesus. In verse 20 we see, Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Verse 21, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord. So first we see here that to Martha, Jesus was who? He was Lord. Amen. Jesus was Lord. Verse 27, and she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So from Martha's perspective, we learn two things about Jesus, or three things. We learn that he is the Lord. We learn that he is the Christ, is the one that has been promised even from the Old Testament to come. And he is the Son of God. In verse 20, in verse 20, um, verse 28, which tells us that when she heard she had said these things, she went away and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher. Jesus is the teacher to Martha. He is the teacher. He is the one that teaches all that pertains to life. He is the one that reveals the Father to us. All the word, all the, all, all the lessons that pertain to eternity comes from the teacher. And she says to him, the teacher has come. Notice that she doesn't say Jesus has come. So in other words, Mary knew exactly who Martha was talking about. She said the teacher has come. Mary knows Jesus as the teacher. And so we can pick up as well and see in verse 32, when Mary herself comes to Jesus, we read, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So from Mary and Martha, we can learn that the right way to look at Jesus is that he is Lord. Amen. He is the teacher. Amen. He is the Christ. Yes. He is the Son of God. Amen. But Jesus himself also tells us who he is. He is someone who is not ashamed, who is not hesitant to declare his own identity. Let us move, flip back just to verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And in verse 41, we see even as he prays to the Father, he comes to the Father and he says that, uh, this is in verse, verse 41, Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead, dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father. In other words, he identifies himself as who? The Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. So it's important for us, to have the right knowledge of who Jesus is. It is important for us to be able to identify with him who exactly he is. He is not just some moral teacher. He's just not some prophet. But he is the Son of God. Amen. Let's turn to John 5.39. John 5.39. Jesus here goes further to say a little bit about himself and he's speaking to the Jews. He says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. At this point, this is not controversial to the Jews because the scriptures in them, they believe they have eternal life. But Jesus goes on further to say, this are they which testify of me. In other words, Jesus' identity is that the word, the scripture, speaks expressly about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes, you Jews think in them you have eternal life. But the truth is that this speak of me. And so for anyone who desires eternal life and read the scriptures, where should they turn their eyes? You turn your eyes onto Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's move to Luke chapter 24. Well, we'll read 25 to 27 on the issue of the identity of Jesus. Luke 24, verse 25 to 27.
And he said to them, and, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The scriptures speak about Jesus. The prophets of old speak about Jesus. That is who he is. He is the word of God. So that's the first point. His identity comes forth here. It's important for us to know his identity so that we can relate with him in the right way. The second point we see is the compassion of Jesus. The compassion of Jesus. We see in the way Jesus relates to Mary and Martha, as we pointed out earlier, there's a distinct difference in the sort of relationship, in the, in the way he converses and interacts with them. I put it to say that for Martha, and anyone who has probably learned a little bit about Martha, she is one of those people that will be considered a pragmatist, a logical, reasoning human being. Mary, on the other hand, is someone who is more of the emotional side. Two different personalities, sisters, two different personalities, going through the same situation, the same difficult situation, the loss of their brother, and handling it very differently. And here I see that the, the compassion of Christ is manifested in the sense that he relates to the two of them, even though they are different, he relates to them in the right way for themselves. It does not relate, Jesus did not relate to Mary as he would have relate, as he related to Martha. And he did not relate to Martha in the way he related to Mary. He related to them in the way that was most beneficial to them. So what do I mean by this? Let's turn back to verse 20 through 27, where we see Martha's pragmatism at play. First we note, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Jesus, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come. Here we see a lot of conversation taking place. Martha is speaking, you know, responding to Jesus. But we see the contrast when Mary shows up. She just says only one thing, Lord, if you had been here... My brother will not have died. And then subsequently all she did was weep. She said nothing else. And so we see a distinct difference in their personalities. And I also noticed that when Martha left the house, nobody went with her. But when Mary left the house, what does the Bible tell us? If we go back to verse, to verse, 20, not to verse, uh, verse 31. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying she is going to the tomb to weep there. Remember that people came to comfort both Martha and Mary. Somehow Martha left the house, no one seemed to have noticed. Mary leaves the house, the whole entourage follows her. Just tells us the difference in their personalities. So just as this thesis, these two sisters have widely different personalities, so do we all. The scholars tell us there are many types of personality traits out there. Some people say five, some people say 16. I don't know which one is true, but I know we are all very different. Even the two kids that I have, I know they are different. Parents will tell you that children are different. But what, so which one, we can ask that, so which one matters, which personality type matters most to Christ? Is the emotional one more pre preferable than the pragmatic one? Are people who are able to sort of hold their, 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 their peace, even, in the, even when within themselves they're in turmoil, are they more preferable? We see that the answer is no. Jesus loves us all the same. It matters nothing to Jesus that Martha is one who is more prone to the, to the logical side of things, whereas Mary is the one that is more emotional. We see that Jesus loved them and he responded and comforted them in the ways that was most beneficial to them. 
her mother who had questions and was thinking Jesus was speaking to her, was assuring her true words. And for Mary, who all she could do was just weep. We read that Jesus also wept. So, what is it that matters to our Lord? What matters, I believe, is that the two of them recognize Jesus as the Lord, the Christ, and the Messiah. So their personality types mattered less than how they viewed Jesus. And so for that reason, he is able to comfort them exactly where they are. And that's, I believe, is all that really matters. Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 29 to 30, because this goes to the heart of what does it mean for us to be able to come before the Lord and for him to be able to relate to us, for him to be able to uh, uh, comfort us. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to, 39, to, to 31 tells us, Jesus says, cast your burdens upon me. Take upon my yoke, which is light and easy. So the expectation that Jesus has for you and I, for us to live our fullness, the fullness of life that he desires for us, is not that we be of a particular personality type, a, person, a particular uh, um, emotional type, or rather that we come to him in the knowledge that he is the Lord and he is the Christ. Amen. Because that is what we see is in common with these two sisters. And why is that so? Because in Hebrews 4 verse 15, Hebrews 4.15, let us turn to that. Hebrews 4.15, we learn something about how you know, Jesus looks at us, how he views us. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So I just want to fo focus on the part when he talks, he sympathizes with weaknesses. Jesus sees us the way we are. And all he asks for us is the humility to accept him as Lord. He will come into our lives and he will meet us where we are. But he will not leave us the same. He will not leave us the same. Anyone who focuses on the life of the, of the disciples, especially someone like Peter, when Jesus came to him, he met him as a fisherman. Not as a learned person, not as a scholar, as a fisherman. A fisherman who was very brash. Very, very brash, you know. There was a time that he's, you know, he was the one who chopped off someone's ear. <laughs> he's the one who said, let us buy swords so that we can go and fight. And he's the same one when a servant's girl told him, you are with Christ. He denied and denied and denied. But the same Peter... Jesus picked him up from where he was. The same Peter was the same one in the Acts of Apostles that would look at the religious leaders and tell them that we would rather obey God than obey man. And after he had been whipped, they counted it what? All joy. They were rejoicing. He was rejoicing. He and John were rejoicing that they could partake of the tribulations of Christ. So we see someone who Jesus picked up from being a mere fisherman. Someone who was of a rash temperament and suddenly becomes the same Apostle Peter. And when you read his epistles, the first Peter and second Peter, you cannot recognize the same fisherman in those epistles. So what does this say to us? It doesn't matter where we are right now. The God of all creation can use you and I. All he is asking for us is to see him as he is, the Lord, the Christ, the teacher, the master. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, on this point, I mentioned that Jesus, uh, John eleven thirty five, 35, that Jesus wept. And I just want to spend a few minutes, seconds, a few minutes on that point. Because we might ask, why did he weep? Well, we know why the people around him wept, right? Verse 33. Therefore, of, of John 11, Therefore when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. 
So might say he wept because everybody around was weeping. Maybe that's true. It's interesting the Bible doesn't say anything about Martha weeping. But why did Jesus weep? These people were weeping because of the loss. It's natural, it's human. They lost a brother and those who came to comfort them were weeping. But Jesus came, what was the purpose of Jesus being there? He came to do what? To raise Lazarus from the dead. So why would he weep? Why would he weep? He's not, he couldn't be weeping because Lazarus was dead. So why would he weep? He was touched. Thank you very much, Ma. See, this is as another example of his compassion towards us. Even though he knew he was going to raise up Lazarus in a few minutes, but yet he was touched by what the people were going through. He was touched by what Mary was going through. His humanity reached out and could experience what they were going through. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I, in, in, in preparing for this sermon, I, I had this question, why would he weep? I mean, he knows he's going to raise him up. I mean, he knows. Why would he weep? It, it, it just, it's not weeping because it, for the same reasons as they are weeping. We know why they are weeping. They think that Lazarus is gone for good. But he knows that Lazarus is not gone for good. So why was he weeping? And I can only just conclude, after much study, that it was just the compassion in him. Looking at them weeping, knowing the kind of pain they were going through, yet not realizing that standing before them was who? The resurrection and the life. It was so, almost to the point of being pathetic. There they are weeping, crying, yet standing before them is the resurrection and the life. And I believe this is why he was weeping, because he, 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 looking at them, he saw that how limited their knowledge was. How limited their understanding of what was going on was. And here we see his compassion. He could relate to them, even though he knew what they did not know, but yet he could relate with them. Pray the Lord will help us to understand the compassion which the Lord has for us, which Jesus has for us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us beyond what we deserve. He loves us in ways that even we cannot comprehend. Amen. 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 So we've seen that the identity of Christ, or the identity of Jesus, even in these verses, we've seen his compassion being manifested. Now we go on to see his glory being manifested. Let's turn to uh, verse 22. Here, Martha reveals something to us concerning the glory of Jesus. And you know, for reasons that we'll get into shortly, I, I honestly believe Martha did not know the full import of what she was saying here. Martha, Martha said, But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Let's read that again. But even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. This is the woman who I just previously said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that what you ask of God, God will give you. If we could stand back and just logically think about that. The next natural question should have been what? Ne next natural statement could have been what? Ask God to raise him. Ask God to raise my brother. I mean, she just confessed it. I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So the next natural question would have been, Ask God to raise, ask God for my brother's life. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And that still doesn't clue her in. Instead, she goes on a tangent. She says, yes, I know. In the last day of resurrection, he will rise again. But here we see the glory of Jesus. The glory is that whatever Jesus asks of the Father, the Father will give to him. Whatever Jesus asks of the Father, the Father will give to him. Amen. Verse 40, but, but, and, and you know, we, we, we can't overlook the coincidence. Going to verse 42, as Jesus prays, Jesus says, I know that you always hear me. Almost as if he's echoing exactly what Martha said. But that is just the truth. 
whatever he asks of the Father, the Father gives to him. So we could ask, what does it take for Jesus to have this sort of privilege? I mean, after all, I believe we have all dealt with the situation of unanswered prayers. Why is it that Jesus, whatever he asks of the Father, the Father will give him? So the first step, obviously, is that he is the Son of God. That is the first reason why whatever he asks of the Father, the Father will give him. But then we are encouraged because in John chapter 1, verse 12, we are told that for as many as will believe in Jesus, to them they get the right to be what? Called the children of God. So we are one step away, one step into this privilege. Jesus would ask because he was the son of God. And he, you know, he talks to God as father. But what more is there to it? We should be mindful of what James chapter 4 verse 3 tells us. James 4 3, I believe is a very it's a very instructive verse when it comes to the issue of prayers and asking and receiving. The apostle there tells us that you ask but receive not because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So we can all ask. We have the freedom to ask because we have the mouth and we can speak and we can utter whatever it is we desire. We have, as they might say, the freedom of speech. <laughs> but we don't have a right to an answer. We have a freedom of speech. We have the right, the freedom to ask. But we do not have a right to, the, to an answer. What does it take? What is the secret by which Martha somehow could discern that whatever Jesus asks of the Father, God will give him? Because that's basically the heart of it. That is the heart of asking. You just don't ask because you feel like, you know, talking. You ask to receive. So let us see what can we learn concerning Christ that might help us to understand the origin, the secrets of his receiving answers from the Lord. So let's just see a couple of verses. John chapter 4 verse 34. Keeping in mind what we just read in James verse 3 John 4 34 tells us Jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work John 6 38 for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me John 8 29 John 8 29 and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And finally, we move to John 11, verse 4, that we read last week. When Jesus heard that, John 11, verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I hope we discern from these few verses that we've read that the secret of receiving from the Lord whatever we ask is knowing and doing the will of the Father. Over and over again, Jesus emphasizes that. We might ask, what does it mean to know the will of the Father? We might ask, what does it mean to do the will of the Father? This is not the message for that. But what we can glean from these verses that we've read is that Jesus does what? He does the will of the Father. He doesn't do his own will. He does that which pleases the Father. And trust me, this is something that I am still working on understanding. Descending in the scripture, what is it that Jesus is saying to us here? Because I, I, I believe he did not just make this statement just for us to read. And fly over. Over and over again, he says, I do not come to do my own will. I have come to do the will of the Father. I do that which pleases Him. It's a point of reflection for me, and I hope it is for you as well. What is the will of the Father? 
How is my life aligned with the will of the Father? Can I, like Jesus, because remember, He is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Yes. He is the one we look up to in this Christian walk. He is the model. We don't look up to any pastor, any bishop, any reverend, evangelist, or pope. We look only unto Jesus. And here he lays out explicitly important things about himself. So I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, how is my own life aligned with this aspect of the life of Jesus? Knowing the will of the Father, doing the will of the Father. Pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And part of that too is having the humility and obedience. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. We are looking into why is it that Jesus has, he has this privilege, he has this glory that whatever he asks of the Father, the Father gives it to him. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has a highly exalted Him. Some will say here, you see a cause and an effect here. We see what is it that Jesus did, and we see what is the consequence of His, 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 of, of his actions. Therefore, God has also highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and those and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we see humility and obedience in Christ. The Bible says that he was in the form of God, and not considered a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Humility is one of those things that we struggle with as human beings because it's difficult to be humble. But we see that that is a key aspect of Jesus being able to receive whatever it is that he asks of the Father. So for us to be able to fully enjoy the privilege of being sons and daughters of the Lord, just of God, just as Jesus is, so already through salvation, we've already enjoyed the first step, which is we are sons and we are daughters of God. Let us know, let us seek out, let us desire to know the will of the Father. And let us with humble obedience aspire to do it. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've seen the identity of Jesus manifest in these verses. We've seen, we've seen His compassion. And we've seen his glory as manifest in the fact that coming before the tomb, his prayer was very simple. Father, I know that you have heard me. I know that you have heard me. Because you always hear me. That is the glory of Jesus. So as we conclude... I want us to just ponder a few points as we conclude. Let's turn to verse 25 and 26 of John chapter 11. John 11, 25 and 26. And I want us to just wrap up here. Because, like I said, the headline of this chapter is the raising from the dead of Lazarus. And it's very easy. I mean, I know the first time I read this, Chapter, for me, that was the focus. And also the other focus was the fact that, you know, the shortest verse in the Bible was here. <laughs> um, but yeah, but there's more to it. And I, and I want us to focus on that in verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Lazarus will be raised. But how many of but we know that Lazarus will die again or go to sleep again? So yes, it's a miracle that he was brought back to life. But that is not the eternal lesson to be learned here. The eternal lesson to be learned here is here is what Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is talking about eternal life here. Let's turn to John chapter 5, verse 24 to 29. John chapter 5, 24 to 29. What is Jesus talking about here? Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, shall live. And who believes in me, he, when he leaves, he shall never die. John 5, 24 to 29. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in me, who, believes in him who, has, who sent me, has everlasting life. I shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgments also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And here Jesus shares the light on what he is saying. So for Lazarus, he was called out from the tomb to, into a physical life where he will die again. But the day is coming when Jesus will descend and he will call out to those who are physically dead. But he will call them out into an eternal life. We should be mindful of this. I believe this is the core message of this whole chapter. It's about life, but not the physical life, but the eternal life that is to come. So I want us to keep it in mind every day and ask ourselves, this passage where Jesus says, where I am, where am I? Am I one of those who believe in him so that even if I die here physically, yes, I will live eternally. Or am I one of those who lives eternally and for that reason, because I believe in Him, I will never know eternal death or condemnation. We should not get carried away by the physical realities that surround us. We should focus our eyes on the second coming of Christ, in which then the Good Shepherd will call out, will call out with His voice, and his sheep, whether they be still physically alive or physically dead, will hear, they will awake into the resurrection of life. I pray that will be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how your word turns us once again to the things that are of eternal value. Not the things that are just physical value. The Bible says that we should not fear that or who those who can destroy just the body. But we should fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. But we do not even as we, you know, we would have rejoiced with Mary and Martha because their brother was raised back to life. But Lord, we don't want to lose sight of the resurrection of life. The one that is to come. The resurrection to which no man, that we, for which there will be no further death. Lazarus was raised into physical life, but he still died again. So Father Lord, please keep it in our hearts and help us to be mindful, O oh God, of the things that are of eternal value. Amen. That we do not lose sight, even in the, in the, in the midst of all the, 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 the affairs of life. Amen. Keep us focused, O oh Lord, on eternity that is to come, O oh God. Let this word have fruit, bear fruit in our lives. Let it have effect in our lives. Let us be able to focus our minds on you, O oh God. 
pray Lord that by your grace none of us will be counted casted out even on that day in the name of Jesus keep us oh Lord even unto your coming oh God in Jesus mighty name we have prayed Amen, Amen. the grace of fellowship the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the blood of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore Amen surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.